Welcome back guys. In some of my more recent videos, I've gotten comments like, how come you're doing it that way? Or what's that tool you're using? Or tell me the specifics of your process here. Those seeking details have suffered at the short attention span of the rest of the world. But in this video, I'm throwing all that out the window. It doesn't matter what your attention span is. I'm going into all the details. I'm gonna spend some time talking about what I do the tools that I use and my process for building a sheath. And it's gonna be all about the Buck 110, right back where I started. My first two videos on YouTube were about building a sheath for the Buck 110. I've learned some things, I've gotten a little bit better and I'm gonna share in detail what I do. First thing we have to do is take care of this edge because once we mold the leather we won't have as good of access you can still mess with it a little bit you're just not going to be able to do as much with that edge after it's molded so we make sure it's squared off we're going to bevel it we're going to dye it we're going to burnish it and have it all the way ready mostly all the way ready before we form the leather So this is the edge beveler I'm using on this one. It's a pretty small edge beveler. I don't know how well you can tell the scale in the video, but it's gonna just put a really small bevel on the edge. And I kind of like that. I like to have a nice thick edge, especially when I don't have a lot of layers of leather that I'm working with. When I've got a couple layers of, you know, like um, 10 ounce leather, then I might use something a little bit bigger maybe one like this craft tool edge beveler that I have. These aren't the nicest. There's nicer edge bevelers out there, but these do the job. So I'll use just a regular leather die. You can use the Feeblings Pro die is, is probably a little bit better, but this works just fine too. And I like to put it in these little pens that you can get off of Amazon. And I'll try and put remember to put a link in the description for these. They're really inexpensive, and when you're doing just um, a, a thin edge like this, if it's not stacked yet, like when you have the whole sheath, it's really easy with this pen to do straight lines. And that's a lot harder to do with the dauber, so this makes it a lot easier. It's not necessary, but it is helpful. And I'll run this across there a few times to get it dyed really well. So I use this leather burnishing machine. This has got the Armitage leather burnishing wheel on here. And you can use the sanding drum on the other side, which you can see I've used that quite a bit. I've made a video about this and it's a really handy tool to have and relatively inexpensive compared to a lot of the, the higher end models that are out there. I always try and feel what direction the grain is going and I'll burnish it with the grain so it feels like it's going this direction and since my wheel is spinning towards me I will make sure that I orient this so that it burnishes in the correct direction. And I'm doing with this while the dye is just slightly wet. You could let the dye dry and then just put, put a little bit of water on the edge and that would work just fine too, but this seems to save a step. You can see the shine already on that edge. So this machine works really fast. Saves a lot of time and does a really nice job. 
So I use this dehydrator a lot just to accelerate the process for me. If I want this to dry a little bit faster so I can move to the next step, I'll just throw it in the dehydrator. I'm gonna do it at like 110. I don't want it to get too hot, especially if the leather's really damp because that can actually um, burn your leather deform it a little bit as it as it dries so i keep it like 110 but when you have the air blowing in there at 110 degrees it dries that stuff really fast and you can move on to the next step a lot more quickly now we're going to go ahead and get this leather damp i already have a little spot here that's a bit damp from where i just wiped something off of there um, you got to make sure you keep your leather clean but I usually will just run this under the sink and I'll run it under the sink until it gets um, soaked completely on this side and then I'll turn it over and hit this side just briefly and let it soak in. And sometimes it comes out a little too wet. For today, I just have a bowl of water here. It's just easier to show you guys with this bowl of water because my sink is a little dirty. But we'll just soak it in here and this will work okay. You can see the bubbles. And some guys will like to soak until it's just completely soaked and they don't see any more bubbles. I don't think you need to get it that wet. I just dip it in and we'll let this water kind of soak in and drip off. Now to me, this is still too wet to mold. And if you do it under the sink, you have maybe a little bit more control of how wet you get it. And you can probably start molding a little sooner but I'm not gonna mold this yet. I think it's too wet. We're gonna have to let it dry or case for a minute. And a lot of times that's what folks refer to that as, is casing the leather. I've seen people put it in a plastic bag, let it sit overnight in a plastic bag. Um, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna let this dry. In fact, I'm even gonna put it back in the dehydrator and let it dry for about 10 minutes. And 10 minutes in the dehydrator will get this to just about the right amount of moisture to do molding. We've been in here 10 minutes. And this looks pretty good. So you want it to where you can bend it and it will somewhat hold its shape. It's not gonna just flop down if you hold it on the edge. So it's re regained some of the stiffness from before you wet the leather. Here's my knife. Make sure you rethink before you do this, which direction you want your knife to lay in the sheath. Which side are you gonna carry it on? In this case, it's gonna be a right side carry sheath with the blade end up. So we're gonna put it in like this. I like to put it up to about where there's a little bit of wood showing between the brass and the top of the sheath here. So this seems to be a pretty good depth where you've got plenty of knife to grab onto, but also plenty of knife in the sheath for good retention. I'm using an antler. Now when you're molding the sheath, a lot of times they call it boning. I know it doesn't sound very nice, but it's not what it sounds like. We're just gonna use this to form the lines around the knife. If you can find an antler like this, keep your eyes peeled because, I mean, you don't find these little spikes that often. This one just happens to have a really nice kind of oppressed shape to it with a very round end and it makes it just perfect for molding the leather. You can buy boning tools though that can do pretty much the same thing. There's a lot of things you can use. I also often use the ends of the handles on my tools and that works pretty good too. So play around with stuff. I've got another antler that I use sometimes as well. So the, both of these are just little spikes that I found and they work pretty good, but I know that that's not always an option for everyone. There's other options out there. When I'm doing the initial forming on this sheath, I will pull the leather in and make sure that I have plenty of material to form around the knife.
And I want to do a double stitch on this sheath, so I need to make sure when I'm cutting this piece that I pr provide plenty of leather so that when I form around the knife, I'll still have plenty of room to do a double stitch. It's okay to get a little extra just in case. I know some people will get on you about wasting leather and whatnot, but it's more of a waste if you cut out a big piece of leather and not end up being able to use it because you didn't cut it big enough. So I always err on the side of taking more than I might need. The thicker your leather is, the harder it's gonna be to form. But you gotta, the, the key is to just keep working it. You know, you might get discouraged and think, well, this is never gonna take the shape that I want it to take, but you'll be surprised as you keep working around the knife, pushing the leather in. You're starting to see the shape take form. The bottom end's gonna be the hardest but we'll get there. Once I get it to about right here, I'm ready to put some staples in. And again, you gotta have enough material to put staples in and do your stitch around the side. And I'm kind of pushing it with this one, honestly, because your staple gun will make a small impression above where the staple goes in. So it takes more space than you think when you're doing this. So I'm just going to try and catch the edge. Plenty of staples in, maybe too many. I think it's fine. And then we can continue to work it and those staples will hold this in place for us. They're going to allow you to really pull that leather around the knife. I'll just keep working around here. Kind of fun. A little bit. I might pull in my other antler because it has a narrower tip here and that allows me, especially like along the blade right here, I can get it in a little bit easier. Get a little bit of tighter mold there. One thing I'll say while I mold this is there is a lot of ways to do things, a lot of tools that will work. So don't let people discourage you. Don't let your lack of tools discourage you. You might be surprised what you can make do with around the house. And you can make some really cool things with just some really basic tools. And I've had this antler since I started leatherworking. I've had this thing for 15 years. And I'm never going to throw it away. Just keep working. You'll get to a point where you can tell that it's not really making a difference anymore. And that's when you're gonna say, okay, I think we've got it to where we want it. Actually, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna call it good for right now. And I'm gonna let this dry I'm gonna put it in the dehydrator for another 10 minutes and I'm gonna come back and do a final molding on here until I, before I let it dry all the way.
take your time. You really can't hurt anything. The worst that could happen at this stage is because the leather is so malleable, malleable, is that the right way to say that? Impressionable. You do have to be careful like with your fingernails, not to put fingernail marks in there while you're holding stuff down. And you might want to be careful not to push too hard with like a sharp point or something like that. But if you're, as long as you're keeping the rounded edges down there for molding, it's really not going to hurt anything to keep working this. And you can work it over till you feel pretty good about things. If you kind of push away as you go down, it sort of eliminates some of the marks smooths out the edges a bit. I think that looks really good. You can see we've got a nice tight fit around the butt of our knife. Not bad, eh? And what we're gonna wanna do while this is still wet is I'll come around this, I'll put my line for stitching, and then I'm gonna come around and put another line because I'm doing a double stitch, and then I'm gonna do a third line where I'll cut this out after it dries. Here's a little CS Osborne awl that I use for all of my scribing. And let me say, I use this little awl all the time for all sorts of things. It's like a $5 awl, nothing fancy, but it works great. And you'll be surprised how much you use it. When I'm doing this line around the knife, if you look in the light, you can kind of see this lighter color area where the curve transitions to flat. And I kind of shoot for that corner right there all the way around the sheath. I try and follow that. And that gives me a pretty tight fit. That leaves room for the knife to go in and out, but it's close enough to keep it nice and tight. Sometimes you have to get to the right angle to see that light, and then you can follow that all the way around. And you do want to take your time because this line cannot be erased. I use this four millimeter pricking iron to mark my double stitch. And then I'll come back with a five millimeter pricking iron to mark the outside edge line. I like to have plenty of space between my outside stitch line and the outside edge of the leather, just to make sure we've got plenty of room to work with if we need to trim that edge up or do any edge work. And we won't be getting the leather stitch too close to the edge of the leather. Time to let it dry, and I'm gonna leave my knife in here. I actually really think it makes a bit of a difference, maybe not a huge difference, but I think it makes a difference to leave the knife in until the leather's dry all the way, or mostly dry. I think it just helps that leather as it dries to kind of mold even more tightly around the knife. And I don't think it's gonna hurt your knife at all, guys. I've made so many sheaths with this buck knife, and if you're really worried about it, you can Put some oil on there, maybe rub some lanolin around it, bag balm, whatever you want to use. I don't like doing that, especially when I'm making a sheath for a customer because I don't want to get a bunch of oil on the leather. But I'm going to wax dip this and it probably wouldn't make a difference anyways. However, I haven't done anything to this and I'm not worried about it. It's not going to rust. It's going to be just fine. Okie doke. Nice and dry. Let's go ahead and cut around here.
I will briefly mention that I, I keep coming back to my DeWalt box knife for cutting leather. I've tried lots of different solutions for leather cutting, and this always comes back to being the best for me. Obviously, the best is if you could have a die for every single leather project that you do and every piece that you cut, but that is not realistic. And this does really good. It's really easy to change the blades, and I'll take these blades to the strop before each project so that I know it's nice and sharp, and it does cut really well. You can replace the blades quickly and easily, so I just keep coming back to it. Now it's time to cut out the back. I use this eight to 10 ounce Herman Oak Veg Tan Leather. This stuff is the best. I do use this template to help trace out the leather loop. When you do this, you kind of have to push and make sure you have the right amount of spread on the front of this sheath because you don't want it to be too narrow. Sometimes it pulls together as it dries. So make sure you get it all just how you want it. Bring this over to the arbor press and I have a whole video about this in fact this was probably the last video that I made before I published this one so you can take a look at that and see how I kind of customize this for me to do leather work and it is very handy to have I'll use these round punches they can help me make good corners and cut things a little bit nicer. I'll clean up these edges here. almost ready to glue these together a couple things we got to do first this edge once it's glued on is not going to be accessible so we're going to finish this edge we'll clean it up on the sander and then we will bevel it dye it burnish it at that point we should be able to glue this on so we'll go there and see uh we'll see how we're doing So when we burnish this edge, what we're trying to do is get all these fibers to lay down in the same direction and lay out nice and smooth. And I've seen a lot of folks talk about sanding this down to higher grits. I have never had much luck with that strategy. You reach a certain level where the leather is frayed and you're not going to get it the frays to be any smaller than that no matter what grid of sandpaper you use, those fibers will still be pretty much the same size on the side of your leather edge. So what I try and do is if there's any really noticeable spots where there's a lot of leather sticking out, I'll take my scissors and come to the back and just trim those spots up. 
with the scissors. These scissors I got at um, a local shop, store, kind of, it's like a kind of a pawn shop where they also get some other random stuff in there. And they're, these were like, you can see the china right there. These were like only five bucks or eight bucks or something like that. They were really cheap, but I really, really like them. And I brought them home and sharpened them up on my D, D, uh, D, D, uh, 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 DL, DRT, what the heck are they called? <laughs> my DMT, I had to look at them first. My DMT sharpening stones, and then I stropped them, you know, with my leather straps over there, and they came out really sharp, and I don't use them for anything except for leather working, and only the leather and the string. That's it. I don't cut anything else with them because I don't want to dull them, and I can always touch them up on the strop, but they stay pretty sharp and I've been impressed with these little $8 scissors. So if you find a find somewhere to get some Chinese $8 Chinese scissors, that's uh, those are pretty handy to have. And then what I'll sometimes do, if I still feel like there's a few little spots that I can't get some of those longer fibers to either go away or lay down, I'll take my lighter and just run it very quickly along the edge and it just burns off some of those longer fibers and you get a pretty good smooth edge. Now we're ready to glue these together. So what we're gonna do is put this on. We will make a very faint line along this top edge and I'm gonna try and make my awl kind of stick underneath this top layer of leather just a little bit because I don't wanna be able to see that line layer, lay it later. I don't wanna be able to see this line later. I just need it to help me know where to rough up the leather for gluing it down. You can use all kinds of things to rough up the leather. I've used the tip of my awl before. You can scrape that on there. That works okay. You can use a piece of sandpaper. My favorite is this rougher that I got off of Etsy. Can't remember the brand name but it works pretty well and you have a lot more control with this thing. And that's just to give the glue on this smooth side of the leather something to adhere to, get a little better bond. A little better bonding. And it's best to err on the side of keeping these marks on the inside of your top of your sheath so that they're in no way visible outside of where the top of that sheath's gonna be. This is all-purpose barge cement. I have used weldwood in the past. Works great as well. I ordered this off of Amazon because it's not available anywhere close to where I live that I've ever found. It was more expensive than Weldwood. Supposedly, from what I've read from other leather workers, this is a better bond than what you would get with Weldwood. I can't say that from personal experience. It doesn't seem very different to me at all. So I don't know that it matters. Um, 
Uh, but weldwood and barge cement, I would say, are the forerunners for what type of glue you might want to use. It's just a contact cement that's going to hold that leather together very well. We just want this to be dry to the touch. It can be a little bit tacky, that's okay. The tackiness is all right. We just don't want it to feel really wet. I think we're doing pretty good. We can go ahead and put this on here. Remember, this glue is really just to hold things together until we can get the stitches in. I'm gonna start up here so that I can make sure my sheath is spreading out as far as I want it to and lining up on the front. And we'll work our way back here. Make sure the top side's the especially important part to get right because you can't trim or sand that top side anymore. We can still do some sanding on the bottom end, but we don't want to do very much, but we can still adjust that some pressure all the way around this. Looking good. We use the sanding drum around the edges and finalize this profile all the way around. And then we'll get ready to put our stitching holes in with the pricking irons. We also need to put our maker's mark on this leather loop because we're not gonna be able to do that after we sew it closed, but it's looking good. This is always when things start to kind of come together visually and you get a little excited about what you're making. So these two radii are just a little barely too tight for this drum. So I'll use the drum around here and then I'll use the drum to get inside these smaller radii. You can use all kinds of sanding attachments on your drill or even just a piece of sandpaper would work. Um, just trying to be efficient. So now that we got two layers of leather together, what we're going for on these edges is making sure that we have a nice square edge all the way around. We want to make sure that one of these layers is not sticking out above the other. We especially want to make sure that the back layer is not shorter or at all inside of the outside layer because when we put our stitching holes in, if you punch through on this line, it might look like this line is right here on this side, but if this side of the leather has been sanded away, your stitching line will come out really close to the edge and you'll have kind of an ugly line on one side and it'll look good on the other side, but the back side won't look nearly as good. So you gotta pay attention to that. And all of that starts with how you do your edges. So make sure that you are paying attention to that. But I think this looks pretty good. We can go around clean up the edges a little bit. I'm not gonna finish them yet because I'll finish them after we sew all the way around. I will finish these edges because I will not have access to them after I sew this leather flap down. This lighter, um, I can't even remember the brand. It is uh, pretty hard to find, actually. I think I bought this one off Amazon, but I don't always have them in stock. And I don't know how many of them they make, but it is super cool. I really, really like it. Uh, it's just a, you know, an old style sort of Zippo almost lighter, only in a canister. So 
It's got a gasket on there, which keeps the fuel from evaporating. And it's got a really big striker wheel that just makes it super easy to strike up. And then you don't have to hold the button down to keep it burning. So really great lighter to have for leatherworking and everything else. Uh, highly recommend. It cost me, I think, about $40, so it wasn't cheap, but it will last forever. I mean, there's nothing on this that can really even break. You just replace the wicks. You can replace the um, magnesium under the striker. You can replace the fuel. You can replace the gasket if you need to, and it will just live on and on. It'll outlive me for sure. We try not to get any mushrooming on our edges when we run it through the burnisher, but it does happen. And when it does, I will just take the edge of my tool, whichever one I choose, and run it along the edge here. Just make sure we're getting that mushroom out. We don't want that there. It's not a good feel or look. And the edge is not as durable when it's mushroomed like that, so. I have wetted this letter, le leather. I have wetted this. I have wetted this leather. And before I actually put the stamp on here, I wanna bend this around and get it kind of positioned where I think I want it for the final sheath. I don't want it to leave too much on top because that makes it hang down lower than I like. So I pull it down, I leave about a half an inch showing up top. Leaves plenty of room for a wide belt but not too much. You can change the angle. Obviously, you don't want this to be tipping down on your belt. So if anything, I would move this back, which would give this an upward cant on your belt. And I've done that before, but I kind of like the looks of it when it just comes straight down like this and it retains the knife very well. So you don't have to worry about that. I think we're going to call that the spot. Now that gives me an idea where to center my maker stamp. Back to the press here to punch our holes for sewing. I'll punch holes all the way around before I fold the loop over and then I'll punch holes through the loop as well and I'll show you that. But um, I'm using some diamond pricking irons. These are from Artisan Leather that I got off of Etsy. I have five millimeter. I also have a set of four millimeter of a different brand that I use. The way it's done more often now is the pricking irons are pressed all the way through the leather. You can do that with a hammer, of course, but I'm gonna use the press because it gives me a 90 degree consistency every time and it's not very loud. 
So that's nice too. I like to put another piece of leather underneath here just to give me a little bit more push through with the pricking iron. And that will make a nicer hole for sewing. So there's a couple ways to do this next part. I could fold this leather loop down and punch my holes through here. I could mark it through those holes with an awl and then punch the holes here. Or I could sew the top part, then fold it down and glue it in place and punch the holes through here. I am going to go for that third option, but before I do that, I'm going to skive a little piece off the end here so that I don't have quite as thick of a chunk where this sews to the main sheath. This skiving knife, oh, there it is focused. This skiving knife is one of my own making. And I made a video about that. I actually use it more than I thought I would. I don't really use it for cutting the leather. I don't like the bevel, the one-sided bevel. Yeah, it's really hard to focus on it right now for some reason, but um, Anyways, uh, you can watch that video and see how I just made it from an old file. Or what was it? Yeah, it was an old file, I think, that I used. No, was it a file? I don't remember. Anyways, something cost a dollar. Uh, of course, everyone comments about the expensive tools that I used. <laughs> so there's that, I guess. But anyways, uh, yeah, a little piece of deer skin wrapped around there just for some comfort. I actually, most of the time, just slide that off because it gets in the way of my getting down really flat to skive edges with this. So, um, and there's that. I'm terrible at filming stitching because I don't have a stitching pony. And so my hands are all over the place when I'm stitching. I don't hold this thing in the same spot and I'm usually sitting down somewhere when I do it. It's just a saddle stitch. You don't need to see it if you don't know how to do a saddle stitch. There are a million videos on YouTube about a saddle stitch, okay? So I'll sew around to this point and we'll come back and I'll show you gluing this piece down here and punching the holes and then I'll finish sewing around to the end. I use these needles that I bought off of Amazon probably about three years ago. Not even sure if they're around anymore, but they're just some extra large sewing needles. Uh, I, I wouldn't call them darning needles and they're not specifically for leather, but they're a good size. glue I got over here. Gosh dang. Let's 
pretty good. This anvil, by the way, I bought at a farm auction. It's just a railroad tie. Railroad? Railroad anvil? Railroad rail? Rail? Rail anvil? What do you call that thing? It's an anvil made out of a railway rail. Turned upside down. But it works really good for what I do. It was like 20 bucks on a farm auction. Time to sew the rest of the way around. It's coming together. We're getting close. I always finish my stitches by coming back at least two holes from the end. And then I'll cut it off short. I'll leave just enough material to melt. like that. Then on both sides. There's two ends sticking out here and I'll melt those with the lighter. This part can be a little bit tricky to make sure that you don't burn the leather. And you can see that I did get a little bit of browning on the leather right there where I burned the last thread. So I pull this away from the thread, strike the lighter, If you leave that there too long, it will burn the leather. I'll go ahead and trim our little bit of excess that we left on our leather loop that we folded down. You can carefully do this with the knife. And then I'll touch it up on the sander. This is also the chance that you can make any final changes that you want to the profile. If there's any spots that you just want to clean up a little bit, now's the chance to do that. I personally like to come to the corners and just take a little bit off the corner, not a lot. I just like to eliminate this sharp corner because those corners tend to get rubbed and pushed against and they kind of mushroom over time and wear out. So I think it's a little better to cut the corner. It's the only corners I cut, I swear. Try and clean the excess dye off of this so that it doesn't overwhelm your project. Dye is tricky. It looks nice until it doesn't. So less is more. And if you will need to slowly increase the amount you're putting on there, you can do that. But start little and build up. I do sometimes come around with a scrap piece of leather and, and take the smooth side and just kind of give it a, this shines up the edge just a little bit more. Kind of 
hit some of the spots that the burnishing wheel might not have contacted quite as well, especially in these little corners like this. I did go ahead and re-wet this so that I can form it one last time now that we have it all sewed together. Can insert, gotta be a little careful because when you re-wet it, especially if your dye is not, if it's water-based dye, it will run a little bit on you. So make sure you're not tracking dye around on your leather. Okay, fits good, but we're gonna do a little reforming. Just re-emphasize these curves. We can kind of adjust up or down, up or down. The other thing I like to do is get the belt loop formed exactly how I want. So we're gonna pinch it. I don't want this loop too far open because we want a nice close fit against the body, but I also don't want it to be too close down at the bottom. So I'm gonna push some leather through here. I've doubled it because I want it to be able to accommodate a thick belt. Push that in there and you can even take your Tool, boning tool, and do a little forming. I actually want this, this rounder one for this right here. Yeah, that's a little better curve on there. We are ready to go into the wax. You know, I choose to finish a lot of my sheaths by dipping them in a mixture of beeswax with tallow and a little bit of lanolin. And it's just a mixture that I've come up with. It's mostly wax, probably about 75% to 80% wax. And the other 20 to 25% is tallow and lanolin. The beeswax is what really reinforces the leather, helps stiffen this sheath up and hold its shape really well. And it will have a rock solid fit on this knife. And you'll notice, let me get us, uh, you can slightly hear that sound of this sheath clicking into place. And it's pretty good. But after we dip this in beeswax and let it cool down, you'll hear this click a lot stronger. It'll hold this knife in really well. It's gonna be virtually waterproof and it'll last for years and years and years. We could dye this. We could finish it with some Neat's Foot Oil. Could even top it off with some Resoline, which I don't actually have any of that right now to show you, but Resoline is a leather finisher, like an acrylic leather finisher and it does help reinforce the fibers in the leather and the neat's foot oil does that as well and that triple combination of, of dye neat's foot oil and resoline actually works to make a pretty solid sheath but something about what the wax does to this leather i just really like I heat my wax up in a crock pot that I got at the thrift store. I think I paid $10 for this, and it does a pretty good job of warming the wax up without burning it. It's not the most precise way to regulate the temperature. I only have two settings, low and high, and I don't really like to heat the wax up hotter than about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Somewhere between 160, 170, or maybe just over 170 degrees is about the ideal temperature to get the wax to penetrate deep into the leather. If it's too cool, when you put the sheath in, it just hardens the wax instantly all around the sheath instead of that wax actually 
soaking into the sheath, it creates sort of a layer of hardened wax because this sheath, of course, is a little bit cooler. And I do a lot of times take the sheath and I'll put it in here. I'll warm it up to maybe 120 degrees or so, and then I'll move it into here and that helps it take the wax really well also. Hello. Me. See the mountains in the I've had all of this life I can handle. Meet me underneath that big mountain in the sky. Okay, I think we're ready, guys. Check this one more time. We're like right at a 170, maybe a little less. I think that's okay. So let's give her a dip. Give her a dip. Those bubbles are all of the wax soaking in, especially around where the stitches are. I'll lift this up. I always lift it up a little bit to see if I can get some bubbles out of the inside. Make sure the wax goes all the way down in there. Kind of moving it, making sure all the sides get wax. You can see the bubbles still coming out, so you know there's still wax soaking into there. That's good. I don't necessarily want to go till there's no bubbles left because I want that leather to still have some capacity to take in some wax even after I pull it out. And I'll just tip it up and shake it like this. this. That helps drip all of that extra wax off the bottom. This step saves you a lot of cleanup later. If you do this process right, you have almost no residue to worry about later. This leather stays hot for a while too, so it's not like it's just gonna cool down all of a sudden and the wax all just gonna harden real fast. That's not what happens. We're still dripping some out of there a little bit, but it's slowing down. Okay, I think we can wipe the excess off. We'll take our knife. We'll push it in. We're just gonna work this leather like almost like you're forming it. And you can even take your tools, your forming tools. I also like to slide something in here just so that it keeps that loop open. And you can press on it that way and not worry about it collapsing. Get the edges the nooks and crannies. Looks good. Man, look at that color, guys. I mean, can you can you make that with dye? I don't know, maybe you can, but I just love that color on the leather. I've never been able to make that with dye. I actually do have a little, some sticky things on here that I don't usually get. So it might be time for me to filter out this batch of wax, but you can just pop them off of there, wipe it down. It's like they were never there. So I'm gonna let this cool all the way down before I pull the knife out because again, kind of like when you're forming the wet leather around this knife, as it cools down, it sort of, sort of just tightens up around the shape of the knife. And then once it's cooled all the way down and hardened, that's your shape and it's gonna hold that. It's gonna do a great job of holding that shape for you, especially with this wax. I really like what the wax dipping does to the edges too. It's not a glossy edge, but it's a very durable finish and it looks really clean and really nice, which I appreciate because I see a lot of people finish things with a really glossy, high, a high gloss edge and I think it looks nice, 
but it doesn't seem very maintainable to me. It, it just seems like something that's gonna wear off pretty fast and you're gonna have to maintain it. You're gonna have to put some effort into maintaining it. Whereas these edges, they more or less maintain themselves. Stellar, it looks stellar. When, was, when this cools all the way down, we'll pull the knife out and I always check inside the sheath just to make sure there's no globs of wax or anything like that that's built up in there. Sometimes I'll have to take a toothpick or something and just pick a couple pieces out and there you will get some that kind of sticks on your knife for the first you know little while um, usually not but occasionally you will get some residue that sticks on your knife just when you're first using the sheath but every use you know that goes away a little bit more until it's gone and so it doesn't last very long but it does happen I think we're ready to pull our knife out. It's cooled down enough now. We will slide this out. Okay, see we pulled a little bit of wax out with that, but it's not gonna hurt anything. We'll clean it up and clean up the front of this. We'll clean up the front of this bit. Looks like I got a tiny bit right here I can pop out of there. Big deal. Shine my light down in here so I can see. It looks pretty clean. A tiny little daub right here. Not too bad, guys. There you go guys, another successful Buck 110 sheath build. I think it turned out good. Time to take pictures and send it to the client. Make sure everything's to their liking and we'll ship it off to its new home. I hope that you guys learned some things by watching me work. I certainly have more to learn myself and improving to do as always. I'm more than happy to hear what your guys' thoughts and comments are. Tell me what you think I can learn from you. So um, teach me. Some other sheaths that I've done this way. This is a, a pack sheath for a buck 113, one of my hunting knives. I like to just throw in my pack and I don't always care if there's a belt loop or not, but you can see that I've used the same wax dipping process here. Just a single stitch and some green thread. And just a really great solid fit. You know, that's never gonna come off. It's never gonna slide out. You can carry it in your pocket like this. Um, I also have a similar design for a uh, Bark River Cub EDC. You can see this one. I even put the Ulti clip on here to carry it in my pocket and it's held up really well. I have carried this a lot and you can, hardly tell the sheath looks really good still so um, and then uh, it's got some lanolin on it here because that's how I like to protect my knives when I'm not using them a lot so that's why this is a little greasy looking but um, I'll put this leather loop on here take the ulti clip off and put the leather loop on here if I want to horizontal carry this if I'm hunting or something like that or put it on my pack so um, that way, you know, it's a pretty versatile sheath. I really like how that one turned out. Our Buck 196 Mini Alpha sheath here. Um, this one uh, I designed more recently and wipe it off. It's been sitting in the dust for a bit, but same, same uh, finishing process really see how even if after it's been sitting for a while if you take a rag to this show you how it just 
really buffs up nice. Okay, so take this, show you the fit here. That's the Buck Mini Alpha. Good little balanced sheath. I really like this knife, by the way. I've made a video about this and made a video about this sheath. Here's one I, I made a while ago for the Buck 113 again. This one with a uh, loop on there and double stitched along the front. I did a video on that one too. Um, I, I have kind of a redesign of this now that I do a little bit different, but still follows the same basic pattern. And probably one of the oldest ones I have around still that's that I wax dipped is this old uh, Buck 112 sheath. And it's, um, I don't know how old it is, a couple of years. And so it's got a lot of dust on it. I haven't picked it up for a while because I've mostly been carrying my Buck 112 in my pocket lately. But you can see how this ages. It has, it gets a nice patina on it, but you can still shine it up really nice. And it holds its shape just amazing. I can really not even squeeze this together. Grab my 112 here, show you the fit. Okay, so it's just, even after years, it still holds tight. And that's what the beeswax does to this leather. And I really like it. So I've made a bunch of sheaths this way, as you can see, and it seems to work pretty well for me. Is it the only way to finish a sheath? No. Is it the best way to finish a sheath? Not necessarily. It's just something that I have come to enjoy doing. And I think it makes a really nice product and something that I think lends itself well to long, hard use. There you go, guys. All the detail in the world that you could ask for. Let me know what you think. How do you do things differently? What questions do you still have? What tools do you use that make things really easy? Because I'm always looking for ways to improve my process, get better at what I do, be able to do it faster. Those are things that I'm always working on. So put some comments down there. Give me a subscription if you think I earned it. Maybe a thumbs up if you think I earned that. I appreciate your guys' support. It means a lot to me. It's been really fun making these videos and I want to keep doing it. So God bless and I'll see you on the next one.